Welcome into another three man rush here on the Buffalo Rumblings Network. Sarah and I are working this thing out. We're uh, <laughs> we're figuring it out slowly but surely. Um, it is a learning process. Um, as you uh, as you've seen the last couple of weeks, we are uh, not quite a three man rush. We're more of a two uh, a two man rush trying to defend the hail mary in the end zone, <laughs> so to speak. But um. We're going to roll with this for a while. We still like the name. We still like everything with it. And uh, we're going to uh, see how it goes. And we appreciate you joining us tonight here on uh, on the Three Man Rush. She is Sarah Larson. I'm the big O, Jerry Ostrowski. And you know what? We are brought to you, football fans, by the good people at Picasso's Pizza. And um, welcome to this episode of the Three Man Rush on the Buffalo Rumblings Vidcast Network, presented by Picasso's Pizza. Treat yourself to the most flavorful pizza on game day. Picasso's We Are Buffalo Pizza, shipping locally and nationwide. Order online at picassospizza.net. So, um, Sarah, how you doing? Uh, before we get into the college stuff, how was, how was your week last week? You actually watched a football game where it was supposed to be played, I see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was actually, uh, it was fun um, playing, uh, going on Thursday and actually having a weekend, right. too. So, uh, I had my own little mini bye week, so... Uh, I was able to be lazy and have a day of football on Sunday, which felt good. Uh, going out to uh, to uh, Boston was was fun last week. It was a little cold, um, but you know I got to get used to it because the next couple of weeks I, I'm definitely going to get cold. So, um, but it was nice, uh, and you know I'm sure the the you know the uh, players enjoy the bye week. So did I. The the mini bye week. So did I. Well, I will say this: I had to. I was following you on social media. I was following some of the other people that were brave enough to head to Boston. Um, I, you know, I, of course I was following um, all the Bills Mafia babes. They seem to be the ones that really, really fire up on the social media. You know, if you want to know what's going on, if you want to know where the party's at, where the jump off is, <laughs> if you want to know where things are happening, you need to follow Sarah and, and, you know, all the Bills Mafia babes. They seem to have, they have a knack of finding where the action is. And I, I couldn't help, but notice that maybe you were treated a little bit rudely by the uh, Bostonians this past yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was actually funny the first day, <laughs> you know, walking around. I actually do it on purpose. If uh, if it's yeah. baseball season, I'll wear my Yankee stuff. If it's football season, I'll wear my Bill stuff. Um, once in a while, you'll catch me out with my Heat stuff. Um, I am legit the worst person to uh, be in, in, in Boston <laughs> when it comes to sports. <laughs> my son goes to school there. But I am not a Boston sports fan whatsoever. Hockey, basketball, football, you know, baseball, any of it. So uh, I told my son if he comes home, one of those fans, he's going to be disowned. So he has very strict rules about being being gone up that way. Um, what he what he's allowed to root for and what he's not. But uh, I actually have a really quick, uh, you know, kind of cool story. I was walking back. I went to go see the, um, well, I went to Starbucks. That was my main purpose was to go get a coffee. <laughs> but as I was walking, I, I passed the Cheers um, bar. So I was taking a couple of pictures and I'm thinking about my dad and I'm, I'm walking back and I'm in my own head, but I'm walking and I, I'm staring at, as I cross the street at this guy and I'm like, God, he looks familiar in a way that like in, in 20 seconds, you're trying to process all this stuff. Right. And I, I'm like, eye contact, he looks at me, I look at him and I, I go to like, finally, it finally occurs to me who he is. And he goes, go bills. And I let out the worst, like weirdest Yelp type thing. And I was like, well, go bills. I realized as I walked past him, that it was Ryan Fitzpatrick. <laughs> and I'm walking down Boston, like going, I just like yelped at Ryan Fitzpatrick. And he probably didn't even, he was like, this girl's not a Bills fan. She didn't even recognize who I was until it was like almost two seconds too late. But I totally recognized who he was. It was just, you don't expect to be walking down the street and having, you know, someone say hi. And to me, I have no idea who was with him. It could have been the whole Thursday night football crew. <laughs> I have absolutely no, because exactly. I, I zoned in. And it, so it was uh, one of those moments where I can laugh at now. But Ryan Fitzpatrick, if you're ever listening to this, <laughs> I knew who you were. <laughs> it wasn't just a dumb blonde moment, I swear. 
But I can't believe, you know, I, I I can't believe that guy in his folk the the he's like his following. I mean, my we're going up in two weeks. We're going to the Dolphins game. Me and my my two oldest boys and my oldest son's girlfriend. We're going up to the game and uh, Owen today. My the the one that's at Tulsa that plays Tulsa. D. He's like, Dad, I got. I'm going to go to the store. I've got to get uh, insulated car hearts. I got to go this. I go. <laughs> He's, so he's actually trying to come up with an outfit to look like fit, to look like Ryan Fitzpatrick. Last time he was at the game, I don't know if you remember that he was wearing back when he was up in the stands. You mean when he had up. no shirt? When he had yes, no shirt? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But he had the Carhartt overalls. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's the kind of influence he has on on the youth yeah. nowadays. But no, I'm looking forward to it. I was, I was glad you had a good time. Uh, obviously, a good football game. We'll get into that a little yep. bit more later. Yep. But um. Sarah, take us through. Uh, we're going to get back into college football. Obviously, uh, regular right. season games are pretty much over, except for uh, what some people call the the game with the most meaning every year, besides the national championship game, and that's the Army Navy game that I believe takes place in Philadelphia this year. Um, you know, that game obviously uh, right. a wonderful game, and they really, really highlight the players and the families and just what it means to be a uh, cadet or a midshipman. But um, you know, our final college football poll was released this week. And, uh, you know, obviously, and, and, you know, when we'll get into that in a second, but when you talk about the army Navy game and have you ever been, by the way, I have, have not. Been? And, and my dad was army. He, he didn't play football for them, but he <clears throat> was in the army. So we would joke every year and, you know, I would say how in the heck, you know, can Navy, <laughs> win this game ever because you know joking as i was growing up i'm like they right. they play on ships you know like when i was a, a lot you know really young kid so right. it was always a joke so but you know we would always watch it and it it's fun it doesn't matter what their records are heading in one can be really good and the other one really bad and the you know and the score shows otherwise um right. but it's just a classic at this point in time and you know it's it's always one of those fun things to watch i think it's like 120 something years at this point yep. that has been going on so um i guess my my main point that you know in the last few years it's it's alternated winners um i think uh, going back 4 years uh, you know um navy army no excuse me army navy army navy last year was navy so if we keep on going with the trend then army would win this year so i've always rooted for army I do have a couple of friends who are who are Navy, so uh, you know it gets a little it gets a little fun. But I don't have any, you know, I don't have any, you know, specific uh, right, care. Right. It's just fun to you know to watch, and it's the conclusion of the the season, you know, for the most part, you know, heading into bowl season. So my son Owen was actually offered to play football at both Army and Navy, okay. and at one time he had committed to play football at West Point, and uh, unfortunately, like a lot of kids in that 2020 class, he was kind of a victim of COVID. Um, oh. Couldn't go anywhere, couldn't see any campuses, couldn't yep. visit any places. And when my it son all- feels your pain there, because yeah, my son all, went through it too. Yep, and when it all shook out, uh, he ended up uh, going to the University of Tulsa because he just, he was comfortable with the university, knew what it was like, he loved the place. And, you know, obviously there was no unknown because unlike the other places, because you couldn't go with COVID, but, uh, watch this game many, many times. It usually takes place in the city of Philadelphia, where I grew up. And, um, you know, if you have military family, you know, like you have, always means something. You know, there's always there's always something you're cheering for. There's always something you're pulling for. And like I said, the TV, CBS has done a wonderful job of really, um, I don't know the term I want to look for, humanizing, um, really kind of making the the special story and really pulling out the the special moments between the players and their families. And I don't know if you've ever seen the beginning of the game. They do a, <clears throat> they usually get Tom Rinaldi or somebody like that, that has one of those just amazing voices to tell stories. And um, <clears throat> they go and they do these stories and they usually bring the moms into it and they interview the moms and, and what it's like to, to walk on campus that day in July and just give your child up for the next 10 years. Yeah. And they tell these stories and I'm like, if you're not crying, I'm not sure you're human <laughs> because right. they're just they're just amazing, amazing stories. But that game this weekend, uh, concept uniforms again for both sides. I think I think uh, Navy's wearing a NASA type uniform and I'm not quite sure what Army's wearing, but they've always honored one of their battalions throughout the, the various wars that our country uh, unfortunately was involved in. But 
You know, we talked about it a little bit ago. Obviously, the final four of the college football playoff was announced this week. I I'm curious to hear what you think about this because you and I've talked about this right. quite a bit. And I don't want to say ad nauseum, but we do talk about this <laughs> quite a bit. And we tend to differ on a few teams. Um and obviously I think the the one the one area of, of discussion you can talk about is TCU loses yeah. the Big 12 championship to Kansas State, and they are still ranked number three. Right. I have my feelings on that. What are your feelings on the Horn Frogs being three over a number four Ohio State Buckeyes? Team? Yeah. So uh, just to go back and kind of you know relook at last week, uh, we both picked Georgia. We both picked Michigan, <clears throat> and then you had picked uh, TCU. I picked TCU. Yep. And I picked Kansas State, but then you had picked Utah, and I had picked USC. So we were both three and one last week. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, with with USC losing, I knew that they were going to fall out, and Ohio State was going to move in. The question was whether or not TCU losing would either push them out or push them at least to four and then move Ohio State into three. But that would have meant, in my opinion, that Michigan would have played Ohio State and the first round of the playoffs. So I think what they did was they looked at TCU and said, Ohio state didn't have a championship game. Alabama didn't have a championship game. Right. We should not be penalizing TCU for having that game for having exactly. that playoff game. So, or that cha championship game. So I think that that's what the committee finally decided in leaving them at three. It was a pretty close game. Um, but you know, I did feel K state was, was going to pull it off. I didn't think that they were going to let them have it two games in a row. I thought it would be a little closer than it was. So, um, I was actually really impressed with K state. Um, but I actually thought that, um, that what the playoff committee did was right, uh, to a certain extent. Now, if you look at TCU's resume, they struggled a lot throughout the year. Do I think they are the number three team in the country? No, I do not. But do I Who think is? I think I think that Ohio State should have been three and, and Alabama should have been four if you were looking at the best teams in the nation. But that's not how the playoff system works. It is a weekly thing and then it kind of cumulative. But you at the end, but you still look at the week before. So in my opinion, they could not take out because TCU was undefeated up into their championship game. You couldn't you couldn't kick them out for a two loss Alabama. Right. But in my opinion, TCU losing to K-State and struggling throughout much of the season. Now they 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 struggled, but they won. Um, I don't think they are the third ranked well, team in the country. I'm not sure. I don't know. I differ from you on the whole TCU struggled, especially with Max Duggan, uh, their quarterback, doing going up to uh, being invited to the Heisman Trophy uh, finals up in uh, New York City. Um, Kansas State is a tremendously good football team, tremendously underrated football team. They're rough. They're rugged. They come out. They smack you in the mouth. Um, Max, he about he about put the team. We basically you can say put the team on his back and pulled him out of the uh, out of the deficit in the fourth quarter. Got to the got to the uh, to the overtime. They decided to go for it on fourth and a foot. I'm not quite sure how you take the ball out of out of the quarterback's hands when he he basically drug K State all over the field in the second half to will the the Horn Frogs right. to to tie it up. So I don't know how you took the ball out of his hands, but they did. And um, jokingly, sometimes... Jerry, I did say that I felt like that K State was going to get the early lead and that TCU was going to find a way to fight back right. in the second half because that's what they've done all right. season long. So I, I, you know, I agree that they, they are a good team. They are a second half team. I was a little bit more concerned with their defense and right. the, the, the uh, college football committee, the selection committee does look at defense a lot, but again, you can't penalize. They had the, the big 12, you know, um, conference championship. You can't penalize them because Ohio state and Alabama and, and them did not. So um, I think that they did it right. But go you ahead. Can look a lot. You can look a lot at, at slow starts, um, you know, but to me, a team that's a second half team has a very good coaching staff because they make adjustments, adjustments. and they're able to they're able to, to, to take what they learned in that first half and adjust and come out in the second half and play well. 
I, I think Ohio State's probably a better football team than them, and I agree with you 100% that they put them at four to keep them away from Michigan um, so that there wasn't that, you know, what's a bigger – what's a what's a better money maker if you have Michigan and Ohio State in the final for the national championship? I mean, everybody wins, right? Well, yeah. except for me because – well, I still <laughs> would win too because I like Michigan, but – Alabama had no right being anywhere near the final four in my estimation. If they did get anywhere near it, it was because of Saban. It was because of their reputation. I thought they played poorly all year long. I think they were sporadic. And I think that they finally felt the uh, effects of a bunch of guys coming out early and going into the league. And they lost kind of that veteran leadership, maybe a little bit, a little bit better in backups. So they're rebuilding. I think they'll be back there next year. Um, you know, it was a really weird year and the fact that five, six, I guess you could say five to 10 could interchange at any time. I mean, I thought right. USC was a joke. Um, you can't play defense the way they do. I think USC is not a very physical football team. I don't think they're that way. They'll never be that way as long as Lincoln Riley's there. That's why Utah won that game because they lined up and hit him straight in the face yeah. and USC could not respond to it. Um, so and Utah you know, played, I mean, they played better than the first game against them. It, yeah, like, I, USC did not have an answer. And hell, it Utah looked like a Final Four team to me. Yeah. And and USC, like, usually their strength has been their <sighs> offense all year. Right. And they couldn't get it going at all. So I was very impressed with how Utah played that game. You know, it's it's one of those things where I'm actually looking forward to expanding to 12 teams. Um, a lot of people, you know, have their, their issues, you know, generally speaking, a 12 team would look like mo most likely the first, you know, the 14 playoffs would have their first week off. Um, right. and then, you know, teams five through, um, 12 would, would play each other. I think it would be interesting to get some of these teams that had a really good end of the year so that, yeah, they might've lost two, ga you know, two games earlier in the season or, you know, one or two games, um, there's even a couple of people like K-State. They lost three. If they get that opportunity because they've done so well towards the end of the year to um, to show what they've got, you know, you know, play in a couple of rounds. And if you keep on going, hey, that, you know, that just goes to show I like it. I'm looking forward to it um, because, like you said, five through ten th this year could have been anybody like it really could have been. You, you know, you could have uh, really argued for quite a few teams. So. I'm looking forward to um, it expanding and it's now expanding two years sooner. It was supposed to um, not happen to 2026 and now right. it's happening 2024. So the it'll finally joined us. Yes. So it'll be cool to, to see that, un, you know, unfold. There's some people that are never going to be happy. Now they they're going to think it's too much. I'm actually looking forward to it. Um, I know that um, it's also going to prepare these, you know, these teams that are, have a lot of talent on their programs, obviously, if they're the top 12 teams in the nation, the juniors and seniors that are probably going to be declaring, it's also going to be prepping them because they're going to get not only more games and they're, they're getting all those more practices. They're going to start to learn what an actual NFC NFL season is going to be like, because that's the biggest difference. They go from 12 games in college to 17 plus playoffs in, uh, in the NFL. So I'm, I'm actually looking forward to it. So I think, to, you know, before, real quick, before we jump over, I think this year was a prime example. And by the way, if you like the show, Three Man Russ, smash the like button, subscribe to us. Uh, we'll be here every week, especially through the off season. We'll start talking about draft and college football players and all of that stuff. We're going to get into a lot of stuff this off season as well, but hit that like, uh, hit that subscribe button. But real fast before we switch to our next topic, I think this year was a prime example, man. They, they kind of for, I don't want to say they forced TCU on us because they had to have them there. They had to because of their record, but really USC, some of these other teams, it was like they were they were trying to force other teams on us because if there ever was an argument that this is a SEC Big Ten uh, college football playoff and that's what everybody thinks this is going to eventually go to, this year was a prime example of that. It was it was it, it you know it wasn't very good. Yeah, I think what that's expanding it to 12, it, it's going to bring in the other conferences. So I have a feeling that what they'll do is they'll make it so the the big uh, the power five, everyone who wins the conference championship gets an automatic bid. So is what I'm I'm assuming. I, I haven't heard that, but I believe that that's what should happen. 
And then based on where they are in the rankings, it's not going to necessarily be one through 12. Um, it'll be the power five um, conference champions and then whoever else falls in based on the the numbers, um, you know, available. So we'll see how they end up doing that. But if that's the case, I like it because then you, t- you start to tend to see, you know, ACC, were they were they really just that bad this year? You know, was um if their best team was was Clemson, you know, yeah. uh Florida State did well towards the end of the year. Uh do you know, do they deserve a chance to you know to show what, what they have? North Carolina lost badly to to Clemson in the, the ACC. Well, again, is that because the ACC is bad or is that because everyone in the ACC is so good that it ends up looking like they're bad because they're playing each other? So it'll be I, I I can't wait for the 12 um the 12 team uh expansion. So it'll definitely be fun to to see that unfold. But we have yeah. uh Syracuse and Buffalo to talk about. Both so, going bowling. Both going bowling. So Syracuse is uh been accepted, well they were offered and they accepted the bid to uh the Pinstripe Bowl in New York City. Yep. Uh that takes place on the 29th of December at 2 p.m. And uh, I, you know, I am a little concerned uh, for, you know, for Dino and the team. Um, Minnesota <laughs> has right. been a, a, a thorn in my side um, with a bowl season with uh, UM and so is Wisconsin. Um, you know, those, those cold weather teams, uh, even if, even playing down here in Miami, it was, uh, it was hard. They're just hard, you know, like hard nosed, uh, you know, guys that that go out there and just kind of beat it out of you. So um, Minnesota has been going through a little bit of changes. They weren't as good this year as um, as they expected, you know, but they were they ended up being eight and five. Uh, and then, you know, obviously Syracuse had the tail of, of two halves of the season. They started out six and zero, oh, and they ended up one and five. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope they they figure it out. Um, my opinion is they've lost quite a few people already to the um, the transfer portal, and uh, we'll see how that affects them. But uh, I'm I'm just happy they've they've gotten a bowl. You know, it, it um, will help for recruiting and uh, and everything going forward. But do you have any opinions on this game? Well, or? Syracuse, you know, Syracuse losing people to the portal is one thing. Uh, but news uh, uh, today it just came across Twitter. Pete Thamel uh, reports Nebraska is going to hire Syracuse's defense coordinator Tony White. Is their next wow. defensive coordinator? Um, he runs a three-three-five defense. Something I'm fami- familiar with is that's what my son runs here at the University of Tulsa. Or he did this past season. Um, they are also in the middle of a uh, a coaching change. But uh, White is going to take uh, prior. He's taken prior assistant experience from Arizona State, New Mexico, San Diego State. Um, he's had multiple offers, but he's decided to uh, join Matt Rule out of Nebraska. And we'll talk about that coaching change here in a second, but. Um, Syracuse definitely um, under transition, and and that's the deal with them. I mean, it's it's the way it is with a lot of teams of that nature. Syracuse is a private university in upstate New York. We all know this. Um, they're not. They're kind of a. Their success comes every cycle, and what I mean by that, a cycle is four years. Uh, freshman to senior class. Now, granted, they can stay for a fifth, but you know, a place like Syracuse is going to get you a year, a couple a couple good seasons every cycle. And I think that's not um, that's not a ridiculous expectation. It's also not a uh, a slam in their case. I mean, when you start talking about finances and things like that, it's it's tough to win in Syracuse. And what Baber's done, uh, especially coming off a two win season, is pretty uh, pretty exceptional. And then also you got Buffalo and uh, being in the MAC, you win six games, you get a chance to go to a bowl. That's big, no matter no matter what. I don't care if you. You you win your six games at Buffalo and the bowl game you go to is played in Lake Placid. I don't. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't right, matter. Right. Well, they you got know, the Camila Bowl. They got the Camila right. Bowl on December twenty seventh. I I mean, I'm glad that they got to play Akron on Friday. Um, right. but to 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 only be a two win team by one point. Um, I mean, I I'm ecstatic that they get the bowl game. Um. But it, it kind of showed that the the pressure of that moment of, you know, we have to win this game or we don't go bowling. Right. Um, it seemed like it got to them a little bit. So I'm glad that they've got it. You know, I think that they they deserve it. You know, they had a little bit of an up and down season. Of course they did. Um, they won six games. 
yeah, so I, I look forward to it. And of course, you know, I'll watch it and check it out and see, you know, see how well they do. I actually have a friend who lives down here um, in South Florida. Her son went to um, to UB last year. I I think it was his senior year. Like senior year was last year. Okay. So um, so she always messages me and you know talks about talks about the bulls so it, uh it'll be fun to talk to you know talk to her about them actually getting a bull game so do we have any idea i i'm embarrassed i I'm, i admit i don't know where it is where is the camellia bowl played um it is you know? in um yeah it's uh alabama montgomery alabama okay, okay so they're playing montgomery so they're probably playing in the old the old blue gray stadium there in montgomery which i've been by cool place Lots and lots of uh, history there. So uh, yeah, it's, and it's awesome. got to be fun for these guys to to travel, you know, and get that bowl experience. So right. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, to be able to read about all that and see, you know, see that how they do and and everything with the bowl game. Well, by next show, we'll have to start getting into our bowl matchups and maybe uh, yep. picking some bowl games every week. That's yep. always a that's always a fun thing to do. Uh, we'll yep. get into some of that as well. But obviously. Uh, we talked a little bit about it with Matt Rule going to Nebraska. I'll talk about that in a moment. What I feel about that hire, as well as a, as well as another. But what comes with the end of the football season also comes with people losing jobs. And uh, there's been quite a few early um, uh, firings in uh, in Division One football as far as head coaches go. Uh, some guys have been let go. Some guys have moved around and joined new teams. Uh, Sarah, we're going to, I'm going to get into a little bit of Luke Fickle at Wisconsin and also the Matt rule at, uh, Nebraska, but a right. couple of, a uh, couple of coaching changes maybe that have, uh, caught your eye that you're excited to see what happens, uh, over the next couple of years. Yeah. So I, I, you know, obviously the biggest name on, on the board would be Deion Sanders. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do at Colorado. I, I am not qualified to comment or discuss whether or not him leaving an HBCU is the right thing to do. You know, obviously, I hate it for Jackson State, but I love it for Dion. So I'm looking forward to seeing. I, I kind of want to see if he can actually coach. You know, is it just his charisma and his, you know, larger than life persona and and his ability to get these four and five star recruits to to, you know, flip and, and go to his program. I want to see if he's going to actually be able to to coach at a power five school. And he's got his work cut out for him. Colorado only won one game this past uh, season. So he's definitely got his work cut out for him. Uh, he's he's already got some a five star, I guess, today um, flip their um, commitment. So it works for him. I just want to see if uh, if it's going to work for him on the on, you know, actual uh, on the field, because you know, even being at, at, you know, JSU, they, it's not like they went undefeated, you know, right. every year that he was there. Um, he, yeah. and he, so he was losing to other, you know, HBCUs. So, um, it's going to be a different level for him. And he had, you know, one of the number one players in the country on his team. So, uh, I, I'd like to see, I, I'm, I said his first year, he's going to go six and six and I, you know, got kind of, uh, talk down about that a little bit, but I just think that he has a lot of changes that he needs to go through. He did get Charles Kelly from, uh, from Alabama, which I think is going to be a very good hire. Um, I know him because of F because he was the defensive coordinator at FSU um, during a very painful point in time for my UM. So um, he's a very good defensive coordinator. What is it coordinator. not a painful point in time for you? <laughs> 20 something years ago. We could do a whole um, other podcast on that. Misery. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We will, <laughs> we'll, we'll digress from the way we won't talk about that right now. I don't want to cry. Um, sure. Yeah. A very disappointing season for the university of Miami. Um, but anyways, Charles Kelly, I know him because of his FSU years. Right. I think that he's going to do very well. Um, I don't think he was able to, do as much as he wanted to at Alabama. Obviously he wasn't the defensive coordinator at Alabama. He was like the assistant or associate um, defensive coordinator. Um, but then they also got um, the Kent state head coach as the offensive coordinator. Um, now you're, now you're getting to what's going to yes. make them win games. I can't think of his first name, but his last name is Lewis, right. Sean, Sean Lewis, Sean Lewis. Okay. So um, I think that that's going to be also interesting because um you know he's already got some high impact guys that is going to make a difference where he doesn't have to really I don't want to say he doesn't have to coach but he can let his offensive and defensive coordinator 
do their jobs and he can be the face of the university, which he already is in three days, um, and, and be out there recruiting and helping turn around the, the, um, the university and the system that, that they're in. Uh, I think that you, you see, you say Deion Sanders name, and then you say the Colorado Buffaloes, they just don't seem to mix, but he's already kind of added this little, you know, swag and everything. And I've seen a couple of the, um, the different, uh, you know, conversations and interviews and stuff that they have. I'm looking forward to it. You know, if I have a team that I'm going to root for this year, other than, you know, my Hurricanes, I will definitely root for them. Um, I'm pulling for him to succeed. You know, one thing about Dion is he's he's very smart. Um, and he's taken all of today's uh, trends and things that are the kids like, and he's taken them to the nth degree. So, for instance, he has a production team with him at all times. And I think it's brilliant. Um, there is no, there is no leaks. There is no hearsay. There is no rumor. Um, they film what he says, they produce it, and then they release it. And uh, you can see it on YouTube. You can see it on social media, Twitter, Instagram. It is constantly out there. Uh, the other deal that Dion understands is you got to have good coaches. Dion's not coming there to be the coach. Dion's coming there to be the CEO of this football team. Uh, he's a that. CEO. He's the head of marketing. Um, he is the head of of uh, recruitment. And that is what he is there to do. He is hiring high profile coaches to be just that high profile, very good coaches. But also I think Dion understands this being a player at Florida state um, going into the league and, you know, Dion, I think played on about five teams in the NFL. But when you, when you, when you look at this, he understands one thing players, you know, you have a good coach, but players win games. You have to have talent. And everything he's doing is about talent acquisition. And what I'll be interested to see, you know, and, and the thing about Dion is there's some there's some words nowadays you can't say in in, in sports that, that turn people off. There's things like discipline, accountability. I had a conversation last night with a really good friend of mine, and you know, to walk in and say we're going to be disciplined, well, you can't say that because that that sets off a trigger. You can't say things like accountability, but you can preach them. Okay. You can preach him by what you do and how you act. And uh, that's what he does. I mean, he's there every day early. He works hard. Um, and as he says, as Jay Spence just said in the chat, he ain't hard to find. So if you want to know what's <laughs> going on, just go find him. So I think it's going to be interesting. I, like you, am really, really interested why he chose Colorado. Um, other than that he said that the uh, – Oh, you said it was beautiful. The air was clean and there was no crime. That's what he said. Yeah, first, I have a feeling going, press conference. <laughs> going from a $300,000 paycheck to a $5.5 .5 million paycheck right. might have been a little bit of a, a push uh, in the right direction. That was part you of know, it. Some people said that there, there, you know, might not have been any other offers. Um, you know, again, he's he's going from an HBCU with uh, with talent and stuff but again he wasn't perfect and you know some people question whether or not it was you know did he do what he did at that level um based on a few a few players that he had or was it because he was an actual good coach so he can answer those questions you know next but year you have to remember this and i don't know i'm not i'm not going to put this out there i've been taught a long time ago not to ask some not to ask a lady her age so i'm not going to do that um <laughs> by all means Believe me, I've been taught well. <laughs> but when I was enough. a kid, this at one time there was a coach at Colorado named Mike McCartney, and he had players like Sal and Essie, Eric Bieniemy. Um, he had um, my man that was the quarterback. He's up the top of my head. I can't uh, uh, remember his name, but he was at Pittsburgh for a while. Um, Cordell Stewart. Uh, they had Cordell Stewart. They had Michael Westbrook at receiver. They had uh, Brown at linebacker. They had uh, Joel Steed at nose guard. They had big, big, big time talent. None of it came from the state of Colorado. All of it came from L.A. and New Jersey and other areas. So it'll be interesting to see if they allow this to happen again, because while they all talk a big game, the board of trustees and everybody has to allow some things to happen, too, uh, for, for Dion to put the team together that he wants to put together. So we'll see how it goes. I'm excited about it. I'm a huge Dion fan. I love his transparency. I love what he's doing. But another coaching job that uh, changed hands, uh, obviously Wisconsin's job was open. And I think Wisconsin went ahead and hired the number one free agent 
in uh, in 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 football. I'd say free agent, but number one coach uh, in football, which was Luke Fickle, and uh, Fickle was a was a three time AAC uh, head coach uh, of the year in the uh, in the AAC at Cincinnati. Um, if you remember last year, if we were had the show last year, we'd have been talking every week about does Cincinnati belong in the Final Four. Obviously, they did. Um, and that outcome was not very good when they played Alabama. But uh, 49-year-old Fickle, he's 93. Uh, he played at OSU, Ohio State, from 93 to 96. He was the interim uh, head coach in 11. I believe that was after Trestle was, uh, was forced to resign. Uh, he was at Cincinnati from 17 to 22. His head coaching record is 62 and 24, two and three in bowl games, and again, 0 and 1 in college football playoff. And when you look at when you look at this uh, this hire by Wisconsin, it just it reeks. This is this is the it just reeks Big Ten, right? I mean, this is just a Big Ten hire. We're going to have a big, tough, physical football team with a big, tough head coach who played at Ohio state and he believes in defense and running the football and all those things. So to me, this goes hand in hand, but I think the thing about fickle, he's very smart. He's a tremendous recruiter and he's gotten to some areas in the United States that many thought that Cincinnati wasn't going to be successful in, but they were. And I think that, um, I think Wisconsin's going to be a contender for the big 10 title pretty soon, because yeah. not only do I think fickle's a good coach, I think he's going to bring the right players in the right type of players that are going to make them that 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 type of right. team that can compete for a title. So I really think the fickle hire was very, very good by Wisconsin. I agree. And I think that uh, Wisconsin, like Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, Iowa, like you're, you're you go with these um, these, you know, Midwest northern teams and they all kind of start to look a little bit alike. You know, they're, right. you know pound uh you know they're gonna pound you on defense they're gonna have a great running game um and then quite a few of them have uh the tight ends that you know that um come around and then usually a crazy offensive line wisconsin had that two years ago and then this year just kind of fell off so um i'm looking forward to uh you know wisconsin succeeding as well uh to be honest with you uh university of wisconsin was one of my son's favorite schools until he went there <laughs> When, when he we went, didn't go uh, on, he didn't go on game day. Evidently, it's no, they, they can't no. jump around and it's nuts. No, he, it was uh, it was just he he went. He was like, this is more you know country than he was uh used to. Um, so was he a terrier so, or is he a golden eagle? No, he um he goes to um to Worcester Polytechnic okay. Institute. Yeah, he's a he's Worcester. a. Yeah, Worcester. Yeah. yeah, he's a he's a nerd. I like how you <laughs> that's the language for smart. Yeah, yep. <laughs> he's a he's a nerd. He he calls me his nerd all the time. So, um, but yeah, we went out there and um, there and University of Minnesota. And I told him if he chose University of Minnesota, I would never visit him or help him travel ever because it was <laughs> never it was negative seventeen degrees when we visited. Uh... So it wasn't happening. But um, yeah, I think it's a really great hire. And uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier, uh, Nebraska with Matt Rule, that's probably the other big name um, out there. Not right. because, you know, of, of credentials or good things, but more the storyline, him getting let go from Carolina, getting all that guaranteed money and then going to over to Nebraska. But how do you feel about that hire? I, I've got a soft spot for Matt Rule. And I think the reason why is uh, – Growing up in Pennsylvania, I was always a um, I was always a Penn State guy. Um, still do have a little bit of Penn State uh, uh, in my heart, so to speak. I'm always is a big fan of theirs. Rule was a Penn State guy, offensive lineman. But when you look at you look at Nebraska, it's probably the one job next to Colorado because Nebraska and Colorado were the same programs as far as you know they were battling in the same recruiting areas in the '80s. And they were getting, uh, they were fighting for a lot of the same players, and they were both really, really successful in the California and East Coast, like Jersey and New York City, New York areas, and um, you know, just marquee teams back in the in the eighties and nineties. And um, Nebraska is the one program where, you know, Wisconsin not so much. I think Wisconsin will be will have quick success behind Luke Fickle, but when you look at Nebraska and why have they been so poor? And some of the coaching hires that they made have been so 
have been puzzling. Now you would think Scott Frost would have hit it out of the would have hit it out of the park, considering he was a Nebraska guy, he played in Nebraska, had tremendous successes, an OC at Oregon, head coach at UCF. Um, you know they had um, oh I can't remember my man's name. Um, um, he was from Youngstown. He was another Bob Stoops guy. Uh, he was there, you know, he was, he was there for a while. They had, uh, they had a uh, good success. Pelini, I believe was his name. Um, they had good success under him, but they ended up firing him. Um, rule is a reclamation expert. Okay. Rule is a guy that can come into programs that are struggling, make them believe, get good talent and be successful. Anybody that can take Temple to a 10 and 4 and 10 and 3 record in two years in a row is a damn genius. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's the way I look at it. He came to Baylor after that, after the Art Briles, um, after the whole Art Briles situation, took over for Jim Grobe, who was the interim president, uh, interim head coach. Grobe was the head coach at Wake Forest for a while. He comes there and he has a, you know, kind of a mediocre first couple of years. Then he goes seven and six. Then he goes 11 and three and he gets the Panthers job. As we know, Nick Saban is the poster boy for this. Some can coach in the college. Some cannot. Um, Rule probably uh, was cursed by a lack of a marquee quarterback more than anything. Kind of what I think Frank Reich was cursed by, a lack of a marquee quarterback. You know, you had names that should be good, but they weren't. Um, I think Matt Rule's tremendous head coach. I think he's going to put a tremendous staff together. We talked about it earlier. He got the defense coordinator from Syracuse. What they have to do, and Trev Alberts, I don't know if you remember Trev Alberts. He was a, a former Nebraska defensive end, a first-round pick by the uh, Indianapolis Colts. We played against him back in the day, had some injury issues, and didn't play very, very long. But he is the athletic director. Okay. They gave Matt Rule an eight-year contract. Yep. And people would say, why in the hell would you give him an eight-year contract? Well, that's more symbolic than anything. It's symbolism. And what that symbolism is, it's saying with an eight-year contract, we are going to let him, we're going to be patient. And we're going to allow him to build this thing properly. And um, now, will that happen? If he's not doing very well, probably not. <laughs> but well, I'll tell you what, I wish, symbolism to it, I, you know? Yeah, I need his uh, his agent because to, to have a guy who is able to figure out a way to get guaranteed money right. the way he has over right. 15 years and right. not have to do a thing at this point in time because he got let go from, you know, from the Panthers and got all that money. And now, you know, he, a year or two down the road, Nebraska could be like, bye. And he's going to get all that money too. So, or at least get bought out. Uh, you know, I'm sure they'll figure something out, but he, yeah, I think it's great. Is, I think he's a very, I think he's a very good head coach. I really do. Um, I, I think we're going to see Carolina be the next. I don't want to. I don't want to put this evil on them and say they're going to be the next Redskins, but their owner's a little bit eclectic. He's a little out there, okay. And I think you're seeing that in Indianapolis. I mean, Ursay is a little bit goofy, right? Um, you got Ursay. Yeah. You've got you've got whatever they're um, doing there. Snyder stuff is starting to hit the fan today. They they talked yep. about the uh, you know Snyder is the one to release the Bruce Allen emails that. Uh, that led to uh, John Gruden having to resign from the yeah. from the Raiders. Yeah. So it's you know there's some guys out there that just maybe they have the money, but as far as NFL right. owners, they're not very very good. But we'll see. I mean, there's a All few right. others. Uh, Satterfield took over for Finkel at uh, at Cincinnati, Cincinnati, and then Jeff yeah. Brom. Yeah, Jeff Brom, who was the head coach at Purdue, it was announced today that he's moving on and going back to his home where he played Louisville. And um, he's there, of course. Uh, Kevin Wilson, the offense coordinator of Ohio State, has moved on to uh, Tulsa. So I'll see a lot of him. Really don't care to talk about who, who free, Sarah. Uh, we'll, we'll let that one go. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to talk about the rest. It's fine. I just wanted to list out, uh, you know, the different ones that have already happened. And, right, you know, and there's then Barry Odom, people- UNLV. Yeah, there's a lot of people that have been, you know, calling for several other coaches' heads. Um, but, you know, uh, it, we'll see how, how the rest of the bowl season plays out and who else is let go and, and, and hired. And I'm sure we'll talk about more. But let's switch gears a little bit to the NFL. and Well, let's we talk re- about it. Let's we get all it received, out there. We all received some really bad news yesterday. Von Miller season ending IR. Uh, he goes into 
Texas has a knee scope planned um, exploratory, they called it, and right. uh, walks out the next day uh, basically with uh, ACL surgery and out for the rest of the season. And now probably out for, you know, good half of 2023. So uh, how, well, how do you feel? Up. I counted it up. I think the beginning of the season is about nine months, is it not? Yeah, it I it happened on Thanksgiving, which is the exact day that happened for Trey White last year. So right. um, you know, Trey White didn't come back until Thanksgiving this year and he played, you know, fifteen or sixteen snaps. So um not saying that they're the same person, they're gonna recover at the same time. Some of it could have been a little bit of Trey White in his own head. Um based on some some reports that he could have probably returned a little earlier. Um, but at, at this point in time, you know, I, I guess as a former player, is is this deflating to the team? Does, you know, you can't really say next man up when it comes to Von Miller because right. there really isn't, you know, it's it's uh, who's, who's going to step up, but no one's going to replace him. Uh, and then that huge, you know, it's, it's hard to say and you hate to say it, but that huge cap hit, um, and he's, he's not going to be available during the most important stretch. And then again, the beginning of next year, uh, and it, it you know, some Brandon Bean was on yesterday and he, he deflected it really well, but, um, there was a question that, you know, do you regret bringing him on? And he was like, absolutely not. He has been worth every single cent that we have, you know, paid him just from his presence being here. Um, and supposedly, you know, as soon as he is healed up over the next week or two, he's going to come back to Buffalo and he'll be on the sidelines, um, which I think is huge. But, you know, how do you feel about losing him? And what do you think it, the team feels at this point? And then how do you how do we move forward? Real quick, when you talk about this injury and I'm going to I'm going to be transparent, I probably I'm, I'm a medical device sales rep. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in sports medicine. I'm not sitting here saying I'm a doctor. Um, but what I am saying is I sit in on about a hundred of these a year and there's, there's, there's now four different styles of graft that they can use to repair the ACL, um, hamstring, patella tendon, quad tendon, and allograft, which is a cadaver, uh, tendon, uh, usually a perineal tendon. Um, but when you, when you talk about an ACL and I think everybody's like, well, how come they didn't know right away? How come they didn't see it on the MRI? What, you know, some, when you tear, a, uh, when you tear a, a ligament like that, they don't just reduce, they don't just re grow back together. They're never the way they were. So he could have stretched this thing and torn a bunch of, of the tissue to where it didn't rupture all the way. And he still had some of his ACL left. So it made it look like, on the test, there was a, you know, a negative drawer test and things like that, which are some of the things they do to, if you ever see a, a guy out on the field, he does it and they'll start moving his knee like this. They're checking to see if there's an end point to that slide. You know, they didn't know definitively, not even off the MRI until they got in there, but there is no like wait and rest. And this thing will, re will, will rejuvenate, heal up and you can play. You've got to get it fixed. It's just the way it is. And I, I would imagine his was probably, a partial tear of something of that nature. And you just, that you have to take, you, you take an ACL that's a, a partial tear and you treat it just like it is a torn ACL and you have to repair it. Depending upon on what, what form that they use as far as the graph will kind of determine a little bit of maybe how quick he can come back or some other things. Um, but in this day and age, the science that we have to fix ACL injuries um, players come back sooner than ever. Um, I remember it back when I played, you tore an ACL, it was a year, 12 months, boom, that is it. There's no other, there's nothing sooner. Then it started creeping up sooner. And I, you've seen some people try to come back in six, seven months. Um, I think it's a little bit harder for a guy like Trey White playing defensive back and the amount of cutting and backpedaling and things that he does. Um, Vaughn's, you know, more of a straight guy. So he's rushing the passer. Um, he will have some lag as far as, you know, getting back into game speed and all those things. You can get as strong as you want on the rehab, but there are some peripheral things that you have to work on. Um, and you just get that through playing and through reps. So um, as far as losing them, I mean, you don't replace guys like Von Miller. Um, he's a tremendous player. Uh, what we brought him in to do, he was doing 
on this, you know, so far this season. He was drawing two blockers, um, tons of attention. It was allowing other guys to be freed up and make plays. Um, I don't think that – you can't sign a guy like Vaughn and something like this happens and then go, well, well, we should have never signed him. Um, injuries right. happen to I anybody. Agree. I mean, they happen to anybody. It's it's just part of the game. Um, and what happened to him wasn't anything that was even violent. It was just kind of a, a misstep and a, and a, and a yeah. bit of bad luck. Um, having him in that locker room will be immense. Uh, he'll continue to be the second defensive line coach, helping guys like Rousseau and Ed Oliver. And he'll be ready to go next year. I think one thing that Von Miller has done throughout his career, he's been a tremendous workout guy. He'll rehabilitate and attack it just like he does games. And I have no worries if he'll play next year. Maybe not the first couple, but he will play by halfway through the season. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, I I, I feel like there's a there's a missing piece now that he's not going to be there, but I feel like, especially because the guys know that he's watching, that you have people like Shaq Lawson and you have people like Gregory Rousseau and, you know, hopefully Boogie Basham. Those are the guys that are going to have to step up and um, and make their their presence known and felt. And go ahead. Well, here's a question. Here's a question for you. Do we have the same football team we had next year now with him not on it? Or do you think we've progressed and have gotten better as a football team, even without Von Miller uh, playing defensive end on Sundays? I feel like bringing him on has made our team better, even when he doesn't play. And I know that sounds you know weird, but I think it's more what he's taught the guys in preparation, what he's taught the guys in the offseason, um, having the young guys go to his camp. I, you know, I see a change in Rousseau and I'm, I'm upset that Rousseau has been, you know, has, has had that high ankle sprain this year because I feel like he hasn't had a chance to just go off. Um, he started it at the beginning of the year. He had, you know, four and a half sacks, um, to start the year. And I'm hoping that, um, he gets that, that opportunity now. Shaq Lawson, for some reason, he can be a bum wherever he wants to play, but when he comes and plays in Buffalo, He's just different. You could tell he wants to be out there and he plays with heart. And, you know, he's not he's not always going to be the best player. He's not always going to take the, you know, the right angles. And we can, you know, all, you know, get angry at him at, at different you know times. But there is nobody out there that goes that plays with as much passion and heart other than maybe Jordan Phillips, who goes out there. And you that's know, who I'm really concerned about, to be honest okay. with you. You're concerned, like what? Yeah, when he not- got hurt last week, when he yeah. drove for the quarterback, landing on his arm, it was a and and we have our own resident expert here on 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 Buffalo Rumblings with uh, banged up Bills. But when you watch that mechanism, he lands on that outstretched shoulder. That's usually that's usually a bad one as far as yeah. instability and and all that. And I felt bad because in that process, you know, I I kind of laughed it off and I was like, he's just got the wind knocked out of him. I'm like, he right. ran he ran probably 75 yards trying to get after right. uh, Mac Jones, trying to to sack him in that that whole instance of that play, ridiculous play, you know, for for no reason. And then he dove for him. Um, so it'll be really sad to to see with him. Uh, being injured but with that being said the bills finally head home we're, we're finally back in orchard park after yep. uh snowmageddon they've been calling it um and uh playing two weeks in detroit and then obviously in uh uh new england uh right outside of boston so foxborough um but with that today we found out milano did not practice again two weeks in a row and uh, that's my, I think my biggest concern going into uh, the Jets game is without Vaughn, I was excited that we finally had pieces back. We had Rousseau back, we had Milano back, we had White back, three of which didn't play against um, against the Jets the first time around. So to know that Milano hasn't played two weeks in a row gets me a little nervous because I like to see him and Edmonds on the field together. I agree. I think they're they're tremendous. Uh... You know, they're like uh, peanut. You know, I don't know if you would say peanut butter and jelly or whatever, but <laughs> jelly's good by itself, and peanut butter's good by itself. But when they're together, they're really good, right? Um, what was that old Reese's commercial? Remember that the person would be in the kitchen and they'd have like the chocolate bar and they'd stumble and they'd fall, and the chocolate went into the peanut butter. You know, it's <laughs> like it, it, it's. 
I, I don't know, man. I, when I look at this, I think I think Edmonds is such a tremendous player. I think like Milano is such a tremendous player. They're unbelievable together because they complement each other so well. And again, that's where up the middle. And I worry about them guys not being totally healthy and in there. And then I really worry about Phillips because I think we do not have much size inside. I don't care what anybody says. I think the team's been different. I mean, obviously Vaughn was a huge addition, but I think Jordan Phillips coming back has been a big deal. Just size up the middle. And then, you know, of course we got to get the Jets now. We're all wearing uh, – what, what's White's first name, the quarterback? You know, now we're wearing Mike T-shirts. White. And, yeah, we're going to rally around Mike White. And, you know, it's bad enough we had to lose to him the first time. Uh, they, they gave us their best shot. You know, we got the Bills coming in. We're going to get after them because they're injured. Now we got this whole fiasco going on. So hopefully we can stop their momentum early. But I think the stats are out there. And when you look at it, I think only one other team has lost more man hours to injury than the Bills. And, you know, I'm hoping – I mean, I'm just – and Richard makes a comment. Richard Russ, I'm hoping the tear was too small to see on the MRI. Um, Again, that's that's usually not how that works. But, um, you know, hopefully hopefully that might happen. But, you know, I I look at our team and I don't want – I haven't been to their practices, okay? I I can't comment on their practices and I can't comment on their training. But when I look at this season, I look at the amount of injuries we have had and the way we didn't handle the heat early in the season, I have to wonder about how I, I wonder about our performance training. I wonder about our strength, our strength room, our, our weight room, rather. And I worry about maybe how we actually hook up in practice. And that's, there's something going on. It's ironic because the last couple of years we've been kind of touted the lucky team, you know, or the team that has one of the best, um, not only facilities, but, um, but trainers and because, and we've remained so healthy for the most part, other than obviously Trey white, um, last year, but you know, it's been, it's been kind of our benefit over the last couple of years. And then this year it is just obviously. And then the year that, you know, we're, you know, dub Super Bowl favorites that um Well I'm being sarcastic, Sarah. Fight. I'm being sarcastic, but getting in a float tub and a cryo to in a cryo booth doesn't prepare you to take a beating from adults right. every weekend. I mean I hear you. ha- your body has to your body has to acclimate to the contact a little bit. You gotta have some 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 face some adversity through practice. Yeah. So but, uh, uh, like last... I said I can't I can't say because I wasn't there. So yeah. So last week, uh, we saw some pretty good things come out of Cook and our running game. Uh, Singletary has been playing consistent, which it, which makes me happy over the last few weeks. And then um, James Cook has not. But last two weeks ago, he they basically didn't include him at all um, after a couple of carries. Last week, they said, you know, let's give it to him. And he went kind of nuts and you know uh i was very very excited to see and actually this week they have him on a lot of uh fantasy football um waiver wire you know as you know if if he's available get him um which shows that people are kind of confident that the bills might switch it up um i still think singletary should be our our back our you know our, our our rb1 i just think that um we need to figure out ways to get cook involved. And I actually liked that. We had four or five plays with um, cook and Hines on the, on the field together. And I actually thought that that was um, a different look. And I liked, I liked seeing it because it was okay. Are they going to hand it off? Are they going to dump it off? If they do dump it off, who are they dumping it You know, dumping it off to um, it was kind of a, an interesting look and, um, and successful too. So how do you feel about the Bills running game and are we turning it on at the right time or do you think it was a little bit of a fluke? I don't know, but I will say is this for, I don't know about turning it on, but you know the Bills have had at least 100 yards rushing every game this season. It's all Josh Allen. <laughs> no, I mean, Josh. A, but is it a running game? Josh has, yeah, it is. It is. But what we've always said is that we don't want Josh to be the running game. And but if you don't give the, the ball, game. if you don't give the ball to the running backs and you keep calling your, your, your quarterback to run the ball, is that the running backs fault? No, it's not. It's not. And it's also not the quarterback's fault when, you know, uh, he's 
doing better than than your running backs. But I honestly think that when it comes to to Josh, I like some of the scripted runs. Like I like them as long as you know, as long as he protects himself in the process. As much has as he, he played better can. the last couple of weeks, Josh? Josh. I feel like he has. I feel like it, I, I still go back to his um his injury against the Jets, and I I still think it was a little mental. I I look at that throw that he threw, and yes, you know people can say that it was you know that spur of the moment thing where he had the adre- adrenaline and everything, but I I look at it as he threw that ball seventy something yards and didn't flinch. I think that he got hit so hard. Um, the week before in, in Green Bay and somebody else brought this up to me. We had, you know, I went back and looked at it and we had this conversation about it. He might've like just had, I don't want to say his bell rung or concussion or anything like that, but I feel like it was, it's been a little, um, a, a little, a, a mental thing, a mental block over the last couple of weeks. Um, I do feel like he got back to himself a little bit um, this week. He didn't look great, you know, playing against Cleveland. He didn't look great playing against Detroit. I think he looked pretty darn good playing against um, the Patriots, even though he you know, wasn't throwing 350 yards and, you know, running for 100. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing how he takes this Jets game back at, and being back at home because he does normally play well at home. So I'm looking forward to it. The The one thing I wanted to point out is it is a 70% chance of rain mm-hmm. on Sunday. So it does look like, you know, We'll probably be running um, the ball more. Uh, you know, obviously, there's no reason why Josh can't throw in the rain. Um, but you know, it, the weather is is forecasted, and it's supposed to be between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. that the rain is pretty consistent. So, and it's going to be cold, 39 degrees in rain. I agree with Calgary Mafia, and he says it seems to seems to him like some contact brings Allen into focus. I saw last that Thursday night game. I like when he runs the ball and he gets up and he looks at somebody, gives him a little bit of a stare. I think he plays. I think he plays better that way. I like him running the ball because I think it puts him into the it, put, it puts him into the game. Um, but I will say it again, and I'm I'm going to preach this because there's a lot of to me there's a lot of naysayers. Uh, last time I checked, we have a hundred yards or more rushing every football game. Yeah, yeah, um, and we're, we're and I one think of the that's top pretty. Teams. I think that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I think we're. Um, I think we know, average one thirty-two or something like that. We're actually one of the. Um, the you have a top you know, ten running game for a team that can't run the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Josh. But we Allen. don't have a top ten turnover ratio. That's a big yeah. difference. Well, and so. I and and Josh has been better with that. And I'm gonna. I'm I'm from New York. We do this whole knock on wood thing. Um, I don't want to jinx him. The last, uh, the last couple of weeks, he's protected the ball. Um, last three weeks, I think he's had one turnover. Um, I don't quote me on that, but out of the, just thinking about it, I think he's only had one. So, um, which he was having two, two or three a game. So, um, I'll take, I'll take one over three weeks. So, um, with that being said, uh, do you have a prediction for, for Sunday? Do I have a prediction? I believe that the Bills will play a tight first half. They will stretch it out into the second half, and they will win a, uh, let's see here, 27 to 17 ball game. That's my score. <laughs> that is my score, 27-17. They are nine-and-a-half-point favorites. So yes. I I did it as uh, picking them with the with the spread, with, with the points. So 27-17. I, like I it. hope it rains. I want it to rain. This is the I time don't. of year. <laughs> this, uh, this is the time of year that the Bills are supposed to. They're uh, supposed to be an advantage to being in the. Jerry, I'm going to come home with pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll do all right. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll make it. I packed, it. We'll I packed it. my poncho. You just hold but... up cue cards. Just hold up cards. <laughs> I packed my poncho, so hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll like uh, Sarah. What do you think, of, Sarah? What do you think of that? <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you take us out? We went a couple minutes over today. Hey, no problem. But, hey, we appreciate you listening and watching the three-man rush. She is Sarah Larson. I'm the big O, Jerry Ostrowski. Spence told me I have to come up with a catchy saying at the end of this thing. Yeah, we got to figure that out. And I need a nickname because, you know, you all have some cool nicknames. And I'm tired of working with uh, the voice and the king and big O. And 
I'm just boring old Sarah, so we got to figure that one out. I tend to always say, I tend to always say, go Bills, one love. Um, I don't know, but, um, you know, I also like what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding. Uh, one hey. of the, one of my favorite songs by, by, um, uh, now, of course, I'm not going to remember who it is. <laughs> I can sing the song and I can't even remember who sings it, Elvis Costello. Um, but anyway, again, she's Sarah Larson. I'm the big O Jerry Ostrowski and, uh, go Bills, one love. Go Bills. <laughs>